everybody. Welcome. It is Monday, July 20th, and we are here with another segment of our July Freedom Series inspired by the U.S. Holiday of Independence Day. I'm one of your hosts, Cecilia Sup. I'm the principal and founder of Rogue Tulips. We offer consulting services, association management services, and distinctive projects. I'm here with my co-host and colleague and friend, Agnes Amos Coleman. And we're also here with our friend, Michael Butera, and our colleague from the Rogue Tulips Network. So Agnes, I'm gonna throw it over to you so you can say hello and, and introduce yourself. Thank you, Cecilia. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience. My name is Agnes Amos Coleman. I'm an author and a consultant. Over to you, Cecilia. Great, thank you, Agnes. And Michael, let me throw it to you so you can say hello and introduce yourself. Well, thank you much. It's nice to be with both of you again. So, Michael Butera, I, I uh, work on the uh, Rogues Tulip uh, Network. I'm very happy to be a part of it. I'm primarily working in governance, strategic development, uh, team development, and, of course, a public speaking career. So, it's happy to be with everybody today. Great, and we're happy you're here too, Michael, and we love working with you and that you're part of our network. So today we talked about we're in a segment of our Freedom Series, and we're calling today's episode Freedom to Choose. Are you mission-driven or vision-driven? So first we're going to start with Michael's going to discuss what mission-driven means, and then we're going to throw it over to Agnes to talk about vision-driven. So Michael, off, off to the races. Well, thanks very much. So when we talk about mission, the first thing, you know, mission and vision are kind of counterintuitive for me. So let me start with where I see mission. Mission essentially is the why of the organization. You know, what's important to my association? What's, what, why does my association exist? Why are we here? So that's what we want to put forward in the, in, in the mission. And it's interesting to see uh, all the different uh, uh, permutations that, that occur, both in the uh, association community and what we can learn from, uh, from uh, corporate friends ar around the globe. So uh, with that in mind, I like to remind everybody, uh, uh, you know, uh, I like quotes. And uh, T.S. Eliot once said, only those who, are, who, who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. And uh, that's, that's where I, I, I look forward to this discussion we're going to have about mission and vision today and how organizations actually develop them. So uh, off to vision. Great. Over to you, Agnes. Thank you, Michael. Well, a vision for me is essentially the how. You know, how are we going to accomplish the mission we've set for the organization. And the how kind of lends itself to that implementation process. You know, the goals, the implementation, where the organization is coming from, aligning that to those corrective strategies and making sure that, you know, we have it all, you know, spelled out for all our stakeholders that's involved so that everybody knows how they tie into that overarching mission of the organization. So again, it, it's that how, it's the implementation phase and the stakeholders that's going to be involved in it and really breaking it down to, you know, to, the, to the little minute details of, of how the organization is going to operate. Wow, that's, that's a great uh, view of vision. I've never thought of it that way. Uh, like a lot of people, I think mission is why we're here why we exist. And so that's why I think the mission-driven organization tends to be successful. And to me, vision, it's not that it's not important, but to me, that's more aspirational. It's, I describe it as what we want to be when we grow up as an organization. So it's kind of like, who do we want to be? You know, when you're a little kid, you say, maybe when I grow up, I'll be a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or a firefighter. Uh, so to me, that's kind of what vision is for organizations. Like, wh who do we want to evolve into? So I don't know how you feel about that. Well, I think, uh, sorry, go ahead, Michael. Well, I was going to say, I, I, I like the way um, uh, Agnes uh, puts it. If you think of mission as the why part of the organization, and you think of vision as the how part of the organization, then you're able to balance this thing off uh, about, you know, future look see what we could be kind of thing with what we actually are and uh, uh, you know we can use some examples here as we move along 
like I said, some from the corporate world and some from the association world as a kind of look, see how, how these things have developed over time. Agnes? I think I was just going to go and reinforce the line that you just mentioned, Michael, that, you know, what we're going to be is going to be formed out of understanding where our vision is, because what we want to be is along the lines of two, three years, or however long we want to look at our strategy, maybe two years, three years, some are doing it six years, some are doing it 10 years. And even in this volatile environment, I think we need to start doing it maybe every six months, <laughs> because things are changing and they're changing very, very fast. So yes, I wanted to just agree with that thought process with Michael that, um, uh, what we will become will be defined by what our vision would look like and overarching what our mission would, you know, what our mission is. So Agnes, no. I'll ask you this follow-up question first. Which one do you think is more important, mission or vision? You know, you can't have a mission without a vision because, and the reason I say that, Cecilia, is because how are we going to implement the vision? I always see that mission as a pie in the sky because, and, and for me, if you're anything like me, I don't like pie in the skies. I'm more of a, let's get down to the business, let's do the work. And if it's too up high, too high in the sky, I don't know how I'm going to implement it. And that's really where I struggle. And I always feel like they, we need both. But I, I think that we really just need to break it down uh, to that simplicity that the vision is how you're going to get the work done. And within that scope of the vision, you can definitely decide what you want to be, what you want your organization to be. Oh, great perspective, you, Michael. You, you know, it's uh, uh, you, we can go back to that book that uh, Simon Sin, Sinek uh, wrote, you know, uh, uh, Start With Why. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I don't disagree with what Agnes said, but the Start With Why is kind of important. Let, let me uh, use a, a corporate example. Uh, you know, uh, people love uh, Starbucks for the most part, that if you're a coffee drinker, I guess, I, even tea these days. But if we go back to where they were and where they are today in terms of the mission, it's real, very interesting. Up until mm. uh, just about uh, eight or nine years ago, Starbucks said that their mission was to establish Starbucks. This is very interesting as the most recognized and respected brand in the world and become a national company with values and guiding principles that employees could be proud of. That's what they had as their original mission. But it's interesting what they did. They changed it. Listen, listen to how, how insightful this really is. Mm -hmm. Starbucks to inspire and nurture the human spirit one person, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. What a difference. And that really describes, you know, a big picture of what mm -hmm. they, uh, of what they want to be. And then of course they have a, a series of value and, and, and vision uh, elements that go along with that. And I, I think that uh, sometimes missions are overthought. People, people go way too far. Uh, in terms of trying to work it out. So for me, I mean, that's an excellent example of how a, a big corporation went from what the heck is this to something that's mm -hmm. very simple, very understandable. This is why we exist. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Because and if we, uh, go ahead. Uh, no, finish your thought, Michael, please. Well, I was going to say, I was going to give you an example in the, in the association uh, well, uh, realm as well. Uh, this one's kind of interesting, too. And it's, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the Club Management Association of America. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good organization. They've been very, very successful. Uh, and, their, you know, their mission is advances the profession of club management by fulfilling the educational and related needs of its members. Mm. Pretty simple, pretty simple. Then they went to provide members with the expertise to deliver an exceptional club experience that fulfills the unexpressed needs and desires of members and guests with their lifestyles. Mm. What a difference. If you really think about it for a while, what we're talking about is why we really exist. And, uh, and then as, as Agnes said, you know, we got to get down to the nuts and bolts, which is the how, how are we going to possibly make this a reality? And mm -hmm. uh, if we do that, if we do that, 
then we can develop a strong strategic uh, plan and a series of implementations that fulfill the mission and the vision uh, of the organization. Interesting. Because I would think if I were a coffee company, my mission would be to sell coffee. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. I mean, so listening to that, no, I love that evolution of the start because like I have two Starbucks cards, you know, full yeah. disclosure, mm -hmm. we're not getting any sponsorship, but give us a call Starbucks. <laughs> 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 but uh, seriously, it's like to me, it's like my mission is to sell coffee because mm -hmm. I am a coffee franchise. But then listening to that evolution of the mission, it, a term that came to my mind, and I'm sure somebody else has said this before visionary mission hmm. oh, the yeah. concept of a visionary mission of this is why we're here this is why we exist but there's more to it like we're going to help each individual person hmm. we're going to make that neighborhood better we're going to help that organization be better well i think it's yeah, i think it's important to see them as a whole instead of as separate parts you know uh, hmm. when uh, you know that's one of the complexities of the new environment of the new century you know hmm. uh, first of all we have all this information floating around uh, which is isn't necessarily data, but there is a lot of information out there. And the second thing is the speed at which everything is happening. I know that Agnes mentioned this a little bit earlier. You know, things are changing so fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's important when you think about vision and mission that you think about it holistically. Uh, mm -hmm. This is why we existed. This is how we're going to do it. And the how part is to sell coffee in one <laughs> cup, uh, you know. One, and, and I like the part about one neighborhood at a time, yes. because that, that you know that uh, you know that holds uh, holds the thing together. Yes. And the same with the club management thing. You know, it's about lifestyles. You know, giving their guests the lifestyle that they want, not what I think it should mm -hmm. be. Kind of routine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And then to that point, I think one of the things that I'm seeing in in the business world, in the association, and outside the association is that. A lot of organizations tying their mission and vision into social responsibility. Because then what it does is that it becomes real to you and I. Um, and, and people can buy into this and they can realize that this is just not about an organization vision mission. It really means a lot to me as the consumer of this product and services. And I think that that's why the social responsibility element has become very holistic as it, as it, as it is. Yeah. You know, I can give you another uh, association example. Uh, uh, this is a big association, does wonderful work, the American Speech Hearing Association. Oh, yes, uh, Andrew. Yeah, right, right. And, uh, you know, uh, here, here's their mission. Here's their mission. It's, it's empowering and supporting speech language pathologists, audiologists, and speech language and hearing scientists through advancing science. Their mission, uh, excuse me, their vision is, this is so succinct, making effective communications a human right, accessible and achievable by all. Now, you could write a whole series of objectives under that that you could really accomplish. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, one of the problems is when we get the mission and vision and strategic development and so forth and so on, far too much ends up uh, on shelves in three ring binders or fancier covers and never gets mm -hmm. done that, you know, that's a whole other series that someday we ought to talk about, but yes, because uh, <laughs> I can yeah. give some examples on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been, uh, I've been empowered and I've been stabbed in the back by both of those things. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely, I think that's actually a series, Michael, talking about strategic planning, <laughs> bad strategic planning, good strategic planning. Do I have some examples? And I've seen some missions that are not just overthought, but poorly thought. They, and they, and they're mm -hmm. not mission statements. Um, and that, that could be a whole other episode. We're actually down to less than two minutes already, which uh, is very amazing to me because this conversation went even more quickly than usual. Um, so Agnes, any closing thoughts as we wrap up for the day? 
I, I think the, for our association community and our global community uh, that don't operate within the association world, I, I think the key here is that when we're creating our mission and vision, we have to understand that there are end users of this mission and vision. And the success story and will be told by these end users. And we just really have to bear that in mind that we don't have to make it very complex. We need to spell it out like a two, like a two, you're spelling it out for a two year old and let them understand that they're the end users and this is how they benefit and this is where the social responsibility comes into play. Yeah, and, and just let me add on, you know, what we're really talking about is focus. You know, what's the focus of the mission? What's the focus of the vision? And I, I love quotes, you know, so I, I'll end with a quote here. It's a Mark Twain quote. He said, you can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. <laughs> That's a great one. I'm from Missouri, and I don't think I even heard that one. <laughs> so, well, I love it. Well, I want to thank Michael for joining us again, and Agnes, as always, a pleasure to be here with you, my co-host and my friend, and I love showing everybody how smart everybody in our network is, and uh, I just want to share the mission of Rogue Tulips very quickly, since we're talking mission versus vision. Uh, the mission of Rogue Tulips is to find inspired solutions to the unique challenges facing our clients in the 21st century, and our vision mm -hmm is to support the creation of a thriving 501c community. So that is our mission and vision, and that's what drives us. So uh, I want to thank everybody again for joining us today. Uh, we have to go rogue for now. But like Agnes and I always say, take 15 minutes and talk with somebody because you might learn something. You can contact any of us via our website, roguetulips.com. Uh, we also encourage you to learn more about the 501C League, a virtual organization for everyone in the 501C community and the people who love them. So until next time, we're signing off for now. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.